rise and shine, it's espresso time. Good morning, Believe Nation. It's Evan. I am not a morning person, but here's what I know. When you start your day with a powerful routine that inspires you, it will change your life, like watching these videos. And in celebration of my recent one-on-one -on -one with Les Brown, get ready for a shot of Enspresso from our vaults with Les Brown. I wake up every morning. Espresso keep me going. I wake up every morning. Is there anything that you wish you uh, didn't do? Yes. I wish I had not waited. 14 years. Somebody said, if you want to lose something, hmm. lose money. You can get that back. Eight out of 10 millionaires have been financially bankrupt. Walt Disney filed bankruptcy seven times and had wow. two nervous breakdowns. But don't lose time. There were 14 years I sat on the sideline. 14 really? years I said, I don't have an investor in me like Tony Robbins. 14 years that said, I don't have an MBA or a PhD and, and I can't compete with these guys. I have the complexion of rejection. 14 years, I silenced myself. Wow. And so I regret that because there are some people that maybe if they'd heard my voice, they would not have turned to drugs. If they'd heard my voice, their lives would have taken a different direction. And I can't get those 14 years back. That haunts me. And maybe, I think that drives me when I speak with such energy. I'm, I'm trying to make up for that time, mm. but I can't. Regret is the thing that I fear the most. The idea that I could have done more, that I could have been more, that I could have pushed harder, that I could have had a bigger impact is the thing that fuels me the most in my life, in my business, in both a business context from accomplishments I could have done or making better videos for you guys and reaching a wider audience, but also my personal life and being a better father and being a better husband and being a better son. It's constantly the drive that I don't want to be 95 years old looking back on my life and thinking, I could have done more, I could have been better. And this really started for me when I was in Paris, when I was 18-ish, and I was on a summer break there, and I had uh, a map, and I was standing outside the Notre Dame Cathedral, and this girl comes up to me, and she wants to ask me for directions, and I'm thinking, hmm, does she really want to ask me for directions? And what I wanted to do was ask her out, and I'm wondering why she asked me directions in French, like her French is perfect, she should know where she's going, like something else is going on here, but I chickened out. I was too afraid. I didn't ask her out. I didn't ask her to, you know, coffee or anything else. And I felt so bad about myself. She left, I took a picture of the area, and when I went home, I put it up on my wall. And it was a constant daily reminder for me. Whenever I woke up, I'd see that picture. Whenever I walked into the room, I would see that picture. The reminder for me was not to live with regret. Because what I did was I let that immediate fear of rejection, of failure, be stronger than me knowing if it was gonna work out or not, than potentially having a great date. And I tried to then take that approach to everything that I did in my life. That if I thought I might regret doing this thing or not doing this thing, then I knew what I had to do. I had to take action. And it's feeling the fear because that immediate fear is real. That immediate fear to ask somebody out, to take that plunge, to take that phone call, to do that speech, to go talk to that customer, that immediate fear is real. What I do is I make the future pain so big, that fear of regret so big, that it forces me to take action. So I put that picture on my wall as a daily reminder for myself that the next time something happens, the next time an opportunity comes in front of me that I might regret not doing, I have to go out. I have to take action. And that actually came for me the next year when I had an opportunity to join this biotech software startup company, I thought I was on the path to be a banker. I had potential great jobs lined up to make eighty dollars to $100,000 starting salary when traveling around the world, or make 300 bucks a month working at this startup company and owning a piece of the business. And I looked at that picture and it made me remember that I don't want to live with regret. That I can handle the business not working out, I can handle starting it and trying it and it failing, but what I couldn't handle is not knowing. Because I could always go back and get another job if I wanted to. I didn't want to be 10 years, 20 years, 30 years later still thinking, what if I just tried that startup company? What if I just said yes? What if I just gave it a month or gave it six months just to see? 
And so the next time that you're feeling that you might live with regret, the next time you are afraid to do something but you know that you really should, I hope that you summon the courage to do it. Remember this video, remember my talk, remember Les's talk. Project forward, the rocking chair test. You're on your rocking chair at age 95, looking back on your life. Fast forward it now here to today. Will you regret for the rest of your life not taking action? And if the answer is yes, then you know what you have to do. Now I've got some special bonus clips that I think you're gonna enjoy. But before that, it's time for the question of the day. I wanna know, what was your single biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action for the next week? When you just watch a video and you get motivated, the sign says you have a 35% chance of actually following through. That's not good enough, Believe Nation. We need to take some action. But when you watch a video, you get motivated and you create a specific plan of action, that number jumps from 35% to 91% chance of you following through. And when you publicly commit to other people, like leaving a comment down in this video, your number jumps to 95% chance of you actually following through on the plan you set for yourself. So I wanna know your single biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action for the next week. Leave it down in the comments below so I can celebrate you. I was riding with a friend the other day, and I, I know this friend of mine who has been working on a job where she's been miserable for a long time. She was telling me about how she was miserable on the job and how, how she was so unhappy. So I said, if, this, if it's that stressful, and, and if it's causing you that much pain, I say, why don't you just quit and do something else? And she said something that really put her in the chorus line with a lot of other people. She said, I would, but. <laughs> and then I started to thinking about that. I said, let me take a poll. So I started talking to other people and I would ask them what they were doing. And I said, but is that your passion? And they would say, no. I said, then what's your real passion? And they would tell me what their real passion was. Then I said, well, then why aren't you doing what you really want to do? Oh, I can do it, but. And they would continue on. So this word, you know, but just kept on coming up. And then it also has some friends like woulda and coulda and shoulda. <laughs> and one day I'm gonna have my own business. Those people who talk about one day I'm gonna. Some of y'all know some of those one day I'm gonna people. Are. Raise your hand. Some of you get up in the morning and look in the mirror at that person. <laughs> I just tease it, I just tease it, all right? So how is it that many times we block ourselves and we use these words almost like we're in a trance, like we're sleepwalking through life, that we find ways to cancel out our dreams. And I think that but is a dream killer, that a lot of things that we want to do, a lot of places we would like to go, a lot of things we would like to experience, and we just stop at but, and we build a case. In fact, I was reading something the other day that, that talked about, but it says, but is an argument for our limitations. And when we argue for our limitations, we get to keep them. <laughs> See, but will cause you to procrastinate, but will cause you to hide out behind fear, but will cause you to come up with all type of excuses that you can validate your inaction and not acting on your dream. And right now, more than ever, people need to look for ways to live their dream. People need, need to look for ways to make it on their own. There is no such thing as job security. There's no such thing as a storm-proof or tragic-proof life. There are no guarantees today, ladies and gentlemen. The illusion is gone. There was a time when, when we graduated from high school, you were told, go to college and get out, and you go and work for a corporation for 30 or 40 years, they'll give you a go watch and you'll retire. <laughs> Special announcement, that day is gone. <laughs> that day is gone, never to return again. So instead of people living in fear, feeling stressed out, feeling powerless, feeling like victims, I think it should be a time that we need to begin to look at ways that we can become an active force in our own lives. Look at ways when we can decide to take charge of our own destiny. Look at ways when we can decide to design a life of substance and begin to truly live our dreams. And it's time for people to decide, I'm ready to get on with my life. Shake somebody's hand on your right and left. A guy named Bob May say this, say, don't let nobody turn you around. Do that right quick. <laughs> Thank you.
Now, you know, a lot of people say, I'm going to live my life one day when things get right. When I get all my bills paid. When I get my feet on the ground. I say, what have you been walking on? <laughs> See, there are no problem-free moments. A guy named Dimples had a record one time called, if it ain't one thing, it's another. <laughs> and I say, if it ain't one thing, it's 12 others. <laughs> Always something there to build a case on why you can't move on, why you can't grow to the next level, why you can't begin to manifest your greatness, why you can't begin to live life on your terms. Always something there to block you, to keep you where you are and keep you from beginning to develop your true greatness. Always some fear. How do we handle it? And I'm saying that if you've been hiding out behind but, if you've been using the fact that you don't have enough money or you don't have the education, take it head on, go get the education. I was saying to a guy the other day who was saying, he, he, I said, how old are you? He says, 47 years old. I said, your sister tell me that you can't read. He said, that's right. I said, why? Well, you know, I, I, I didn't go to school. I said, Excuse me, how old are you? I'm 47. 47? Yes. And you can't read or write? Yes. Have you ever heard of adult school, adult education? Have, have you decided that you should learn how to read to begin to expand your world. Why are you using that as a racket? Why don't you decide now that you're gonna expand your world, that if other people can learn, you could learn too? Well, it's hard for me. How do you, have you been and sit in a class yet? Have you signed up yet? No, I haven't. See, a lot of people say no, ladies and gentlemen, to things and they don't even know what they're saying no to. They haven't even challenged themselves. He hasn't even gone to sit into a class and say, teach me how to read. Instead, it's been easier for him to go through life, he thinks, trying to play a whole con game, pretending he knows how to do something that he doesn't know how to do. And you know what? Most of us go through life like that. Most of us go through life pretending. Pretending that we're satisfied where we are, pretending that everything is okay, pretending that, that we don't have any special goals or ambitions or desires, when really deep down inside we do really want more. But if you look at our behavior, if you judge based upon what we do, that really will tell you some true stories about people because you have to judge a tree by the fruit it bears, not the fruit that it talks about. See, a lot of people pretend that they want more out of life, but all you have to do is watch their actions. That will tell you something. So I used to pretend that I wanted to lose weight, but how could you tell I was pretending? <laughs> watch me when I have a piece of sweet potato pie. <laughs> Let me get within walking distance of some peanuts. <laughs> some potato chips. See, I was pretending that I really wanted to lose weight. No, you just watch what I eat. I'll tell you what I'm seriously committed to. People will tell you, oh yeah, one day I want to have a restaurant. See, they're pretending they want to go into business for themselves. They're not serious. How can you tell less? Watch their actions. Watch what they're doing. The proof is in the pudding. So if you want to do something, if you thought about something you want to do, take it head on. Decide that you're going to start looking at it, start doing research on it, start tackling it, start becoming involved in whatever and wherever it might lead you to begin to explore the possibilities in that particular thing that you're seeking so that you can begin to learn all you can about it. Decide that you're gonna face it, that whatever shortcomings you have, that you're gonna strengthen yourself there. Whatever training that's required, that you're gonna go get that training, that you're gonna get started right now. And George Washington Carver would say, do what you can, where you are with what you have, and never be satisfied. S.B. Fuller used to say, and you heard Joe Dudley talk about, always strive to be more than that which you are. Yeah, don't get satisfied with yourself. Always know that wherever you are, you can enjoy more, that you deserve more. But most people, you know what they do? Most people go through life quietly and safely, tiptoeing to an early grade. Find out what it is you want, and go after it as if your life depends on it. Why? Because it does. People that have found their passion, 
people that found the things that they love, people that have found the things that they can pour their lives into, those people live longer. I was in New York and I had to do a seminar at a special church and a guy by the name of Reverend Johnny Youngblood. And I said, how is it that you were able to build this big housing facility and got all of the various community and religious groups together to, to have this dwelling for 2,000 residents that were, were once homeless? How were you able to take on this responsibility? Wasn't it overwhelming? He said, the kind of work I do, he said, it's in me. I've got to live what's in me. And I think that's everybody's desire in life. You've got to live what's in you. Life is just too short and unpredictable. But what, are, what do we say? But, but there always be tomorrow. Oh, no. <laughs> there are no guarantees you're going to show up tomorrow. There are a lot of people who were here yesterday that they're not here today. There are a lot of opportunities that were around yesterday. They're not here today. Oh, you can wait, but you know what Abraham Lincoln said? Well, good things might come to those who, who wait, but only the things that have been left over by those who hustle. <laughs> <laughs> so who wanna go through life picking up leftovers? You deserve much more than that. The leftovers that somebody has left you. So take it head on, begin to explore it. Here's something else. Decide to do it now. Decide whatever you want to do, that you are now going to become actively involved right now, exploring the possibilities for you. That you're going to look at it and do just a little bit of it right now. When I decided to become a speaker, I didn't just quit my job and just ran out and say, I'm a motivational speaker. No. What I did was I decided to start looking at other people that were involved in the speaking profession. I volunteered to work with some speakers so that I could learn. Whatever you want to do, get your feet wet. Gain some experience doing some volunteer work in the area and find out whether or not this thing you want to do will fit for you. A friend of mine told me he wanted to have a restaurant. I said, have you ever operated a restaurant before? He said, no. I said, well, really, you don't even know if you want one. I said, what's your expertise? What do you bring to the table? He said, I can cook real good. I said, well, what about the management side? What about the business part of the restaurant? You're not going to be cooking all the time. Somebody's got to receive the money. Who's going to manage the personnel? He said, you got it right. You got a point there. So this guy got a job in a restaurant in the evening time on a part-time basis. After doing that for a while, he said, you know what? I think I just want to be a chef. <laughs> he said, after working there, people didn't show up to work. He, he said, it's hard to find the help. People weren't responsible, the headaches, the guests were just giving him problems day in and day out. They weren't ever satisfied. He said, no, I just think I'll stick to cooking. <laughs> See, you got to find out what fits for you. Because you might decide that after you go up in there and examine it and experience it and, and get some experience under your belt on it, well, you say, this is really not what I want. This does not fit for me. So decide that you're going to do that. Now, John H. Johnson said something that's very important. He said, there is no defense against an excellence that meets a pressing public need. See, whatever you decide to do, look at it and find out what is it that I have that I could bring to the table that can begin to enable me to ensure that I could be successful in this. Where is the opening for you? There's room for you out here. Out here in the arena called life, there's room for you to come out and live your dream. Don't allow but to keep you in the corner, or keep you up in the bleachers, looking at life, being a spectator, not being a participant, making a difference in life. I believe that all of us came here with something. All of us showed up to give something, and that nobody, but nobody's going to give that service that you have to give. No one's going to produce your product. No one's going to write your book. No one's going to open your academy. No one's going to begin to create your daycare with a special curriculum to help to cultivate the high self-esteem in our children. That's your idea. And if you don't bring your idea out here, when you die, all of us will suffer because we've been deprived of your genius because you allowed but to keep you in the bleachers and not pursuing your greatness. You take it to your grave with you. And that's what most people do. I think that's why the guy said that many people die at age 21 and don't get buried until they're 65. They're walking dead. You can tell them by the way they walk. <laughs> How they look in the face when they speak to you. I was giving a speech at this high school and a lady came after school. She said, Mr. Brown, 
I want to talk to you about my son. I said, what is it? She said, he's not motivated. I said, I wonder why. You got to have energy, ladies and gentlemen. You got to have life. If you're excited about what you're doing, even in the area of selling, you know people don't buy because of logical reasoning. People buy because of your way of feeling. People don't like to be around dead people. No, no, let the dead bury the dead. No, no, keep them away from you before they grab you and run a hole over to you. Or something. No. So the fact that, that whatever you do, you want to be excited about it. You want to have the kind of excitement that is so contagious that people want to be around you. Because whatever you're doing, whatever you talk to people about this particular idea that you have, they're looking at you and they want to know, do you believe it? And are you the kind of person they want to be in business with? And if you're not positive, if you're not energetic, if you're not fired up about it, how can you expect anybody else to be fired up about your idea? Am I right? All right, repeat out to me, please. I'm going to be fired up about my dream. I'm going to go at it with everything I got. Shake somebody's hand on your right and left and say, you got what it takes. There are a lot of people who say, but I tried once or twice and it didn't work out. And so they use that as an excuse not to ever come out again. Guy said, um, if at first you don't succeed, you're running about average. <laughs> so, so, so if you have come out here with an idea and it didn't work out two or three times, well, that's all right. You're running about average. You know, I heard something, a, a, a jarring question. It says, why is it that people prefer known hells to unknown heavens. You know why? Because it's comfortable, ladies and gentlemen. I remember I was in um, a service once and I heard Dr. Johnny Coleman give this example. She talked about a man who had been captured behind the enemy lines in a war and was sentenced to, to be killed or another option. Captain said to the guy, listen, he said, tomorrow morning at six o'clock, you can face the firing squad or you can go out this door over here. And the guy said, what's out the door? He said, no one knows. All we can tell you, just unknown horrors. He thought, and the next morning he selected the firing squad. After the shots rang out, the captain's secretary said, What's beyond that door? And he said, freedom. But very few people would select to do it because it's unknown. See, a lot of people never live their dreams. A lot of people never do the things they want to do. A lot of people stay on jobs where they're miserable. I read an article called, Is Your Job Making You Sick? A lot of people, some of y'all know about that already here. <laughs> so go on and say amen, it's all right. <laughs> that one lady told me, she said, Les, I, when I used to go to work, she said, when I stepped in the door, it felt like a refrigerator dropped on my shoulders. How many of y'all understand that kind of feeling? <laughs> they were miserable, just hated to go after 60 minutes on Sunday afternoon. Oh, come Monday morning, my head used to throb. I just couldn't take it. Didn't want to go sometime just, just for the heck of it. I just drive on by. <laughs> <laughs> Whew, I, I used to hate to go to work. Many of us choose an active living death. Many of us are walking dead. The walking dead. That we're not doing what we want to do. Many of us stay in relationships where we're dying together rather than growing and expanding and living together. We're miserable, but because we don't have the courage to see ourselves beyond that relationship that has turned toxic, we go through life living dead people. And you can always tell couples that have been together for a little while. 
go in a restaurant, the ones sitting side by side, giggling and talking to each other, feeding each other with their fork and spoon, they just got together for one week. <laughs> you see them in the car, they're sitting all up for each other, hugging and smug. Oh, they've been together about three days, all right? <laughs> but if you see people sitting in the restaurant, two people, you know, see a couple, and they're sitting in front of each other, <laughs> Take so long for this food, I wonder when they're gonna hurry up. <laughs> Those are the married ones. <laughs> oh, but what if I know people have been married for years, living in two separate rooms, sleeping in two separate beds? Well, it's cheaper to keep it, not necessarily. <laughs> it's according to the price you wanna pay. See, the price of peace of mind, the price of living the truth of being honest with yourself and say, wait a minute, it's got to be more than this. So you've got to decide, wait, wait. Even if I, I, things don't work out, even if I experience defeat or failure, that does not make me a failure. It's a difference between failing and being a failure. If, you, if things don't work out, if you don't produce the results you want, that's all. But don't confuse who you are with the results that you produce. I used to be a state legislator in Columbus, Ohio. And I remember once I was going to introduce some legislation on the floor, and after getting that legislation passed, um, a guy came up behind me, and he had some legislation that I opposed him on that. And I was about to stand up to debate this guy, and the guy next to me said, excuse me, don't, don't debate that guy, why? Do you know who that is? I said, no, that's Will Konsky from Toledo. That's a bad dude. He's a lawyer, Les. That man can debate. I don't care, I'm Les Brown, maybe Brown's ball. <laughs> so I raised my hand, Mr. Speaker, he said, the gentleman from the 29th House District? He said, yes sir, to tell the gentleman I'd like to take him on. Challenge him on this legislation. He said, Will Cost, he said, I would more than like to, Mr. Speaker. Everybody would say, whoa. <laughs> I asked him some questions, he responded. I said, I wonder why I asked that man that question. <laughs> well, Koski won't be out. I mean, I was so embarrassed, I just limped back to my room with my yes, I can attitude. <laughs> However, here's what I learned. When you win, see, if I win a debate, I win because of what I know. When I lose, I lose because of what I don't know. So I had to check out what is it that I did not know. I wasn't prepared. I did not do enough research. I did not do my homework. So he handled me like he wanted to. So I came back again. I waited on some other legislation, did my homework, but he was more than able to take me out again. But pretty soon, each time it would take him, it would become a little bit more difficult and a little bit more difficult. And the older guy said, would you argue in behalf of this legislation for me? I said, sure. I started volunteering to do work in the legislative committees for the older guys. I said, absolutely. And the more I did it, the better I became. And then people began to start respecting me. And when I would ask and say, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to speak on that bill. Some guy's lips start trembling and stuff like Jimmy. I don't know. Well, wait a minute, is there anything wrong? Do we have a problem here? <laughs> but if I wasn't willing to be humiliated, if I wasn't willing to allow myself to be embarrassed, if I wasn't willing to be de debated and defeated, if I wasn't willing to look at it and say, well, I, I, I'm just not good as I'm going to be. You know what that lady say? Lord, I ain't what I want to be, ain't what I'm going to be, but thank God I sure ain't what I was. Success to me, is doing that which resonates with your heart, that provides some quality of service to others. When you're doing that, uh, in my life, I, I help people to change their lives. And, and when I do that, you know, love, happiness, and inspiration are perfumes you can't sprinkle on others without getting a few drops on yourself. I want you to look at something right now. Think of some major goal you want, or maybe it's one you're already working on and you have experienced a lot of setbacks, a lot of defeats. You've experienced a lot of disappointment. Maybe you've already given up. And maybe you just need a little fire, a little encouragement to get back in the game again. Here's what I want you to look at. There are winners, and there are losers, and there are people who have not discovered how to win. And all they need is some coaching. All they need is some 
help and assistance, just a little support. All they need is some insight or a different strategy or plan of action to make some adjustments that will open up the key to a whole new future for them, that will give them access to the unlimited power that they have within themselves. That's all that they need. So what I want you to do is, is think about something you want for you, that's real for you, that's important for you, that will give your life some special meaning and power. And I don't even want you to say, I can do that. I don't want you to assume that. See, five years ago, when I started out in this area, I would not have been able to make the mental leap that I would be up to where I am right now. I don't want you to begin to just psych yourself out. No, no. I want you to be able to say something to yourself that will enable you to maintain a level of integrity with yourself. That when you say this, even when you face tremendous setbacks, it, it will be a benchmark to keep you in the game, to keep you moving forward and experimenting and readjusting your strategy and your plan of action continuously, looking for ways to win. So what is that something? When you got an idea, you want to move on. You might not have the money, you might not have the education. You might not have the support or the resources you need. What is that something that can keep us going that will enable us to act on our dream? What's one of those keys that will begin to help us to discover the secrets to our dream? Here's what I want you to repeat after me, please, with power and conviction. Say, it's possible. It's possible. That's all I want you to do when you look at your dream. You say to yourself every day, it's possible. You say that every day to yourself, it's possible. Because what does that do? See, it begins to change your belief system. See, the way in which we operate, ladies and gentlemen, it's a manifestation of what we believe, what's possible for us. Whatever you've done up to this point, all that it really is, is a duplication, it's a reproduction of what you believe subconsciously that you deserve and what's possible for your life. Before April 1954, the common belief, the universal belief, because it had been tried again and again and again and people had failed, the belief was that man was not physically capable of breaking the four minute barrier, that he could not run a mile in less than four minutes. That was the belief on the planet. It had never been done. But here's what happened, ladies and gentlemen. Roger Bannister came along, and he broke the four-minute barrier. Now here's what's significant about that. Since that time, up to this day, over 20,000 people have done it, including high school kids. What changed? 20,000 people, what changed? Here's what happened when they got on the track. They knew it had been done. And because they knew it had been done, there was a new belief about this barrier, about this goal that was unreachable. And those 20,000 people got in a race believing, knowing in their heart that someone had done it, that it's possible that they could do it. And I'm saying that if you know anybody that had some goal, some dream, something they wanted to do, and they did it, then I'm saying that you know in your heart that if someone has done it, then you can do it. It's possible. And that if someone can make their dream become a reality, that it's, it's possible that you can make your dream become reality. If you constantly remind yourself after every defeat, after every setback, every time you get knocked down, I've got a saying, if life knocks you down, try and land on your back because if you can look up, you can get up. See, a lot of people, because of failure, they stop, they stop believing. Let me share something with you. You will fail your way to success. Yes, eight out of 10 millionaires have been financially bankrupt. You will fail your way to success. It doesn't matter how many times you fail. It doesn't matter how many times people tell you that you can't do it. It doesn't matter if you don't have a dime in the bank. You will fail your way to success. That in the process of working on your dreams, you are going to incur, incur a lot of disappointment, a lot of failure, a lot of pain, a lot of setbacks, a lot of defeats. But in the process of doing that, you will discover some things about yourself that you don't know right now. 
What you will realize is that you have greatness within you. What you'll realize is that you're more powerful than you can ever begin to imagine. What you will realize is that you are greater than your circumstances, that you don't have to go through life being a victim. As Jack indicated, I was born in Miami, Florida, in an area called Liberty City, in an abandoned building on a hard Nanolian floor with my twin brother. We were six weeks of age, we were adopted. When I was in fifth grade, I was identified as EMR, labeled, educable, mentally retarded, put back from the fifth grade into the fourth grade, and stayed in that category until I got out of high school. I don't have any college training, but I met a high school teacher who one day changed my life. I was waiting on another student, and when he came in, he said to me, young man, go to the board and write what I'm about to tell you. And I said, I, I can't do that, sir. He said, why not? I said, I'm not one of your students. He said, it doesn't matter, follow my directions now. I said, I can't do that, sir. He said, why not? I said, because I'm educable, mentally retarded. And he came from behind his desk and he looked at me. He said, don't ever say that again. Someone's opinion of you does not have to become your reality. Now, I always do a needs assessment. When I'm training speakers, I tell them, don't assume you know. Each audience is a different type of personality. Each area of industry, if you want to go big, if you want to speak globally, you want to become an expert on the audience. You've got to learn and you got to study them so that you can have the versatility and flexibility mm -hmm. to speak to any type of audience with your story yeah. and be able to transform them individually and collectively. And that impact will drive your income and your requests. The average speaker would get around 25 to 30 requests a year. I get over 3,000 because wow. of using that principle. And, and many of the speakers that I've trained now, and some of them have passed me using the same technique and strategies wow. and have made millions of dollars. How do you build that resilience? So maybe by the time you get to cancer, you've already done so much work. So I get maybe how that one, you're, you're protected by the mechanisms you've built. But in the beginning, how did you crawl out from under the labels that people were putting on you? The easiest thing I've done was to get out from under the labels and to live the life that I live. The most difficult thing I've ever done was to believe that I can do it. What's the difference? Uh, the difference is that when you don't know what's impacting you and it's, it's something that, that's holding you down and you're not aware of it, of the great anthropologist Margaret Mead was in a restaurant in London and, and a guy was serving her and said, there are several Americans here tonight. And she said, is that right? Yeah. So let me know when you serve them dessert. I'll tell you exactly how many are here. He said, oh, you couldn't possibly. And so he came back and said, okay, I've done it. And she got up and she walked around and she came back and she said, there are around 25 here. And he looked at the roster. How did you know that? Say, in America, we eat differently from you when we eat a dessert. You eat it from the crust toward the tip. We eat it from the tip toward the crust. When you eat a slice of pie, how do you eat yours? Uh, definitely, yeah, from the, the tip back to the crust, for sure. Yeah, okay, and so, so there are things that when you, in, in my situation, when you live in a dominant culture that is designed to destroy your sense of self and your belief in yourself, and, and you have to learn ways in which you can begin to connect with this power that you have within yourself to handle where you are. The key is to be constantly in a perpetual process of discovering the truth of who you are and fighting constantly to look for ways in which you can escape the inner conversation. I speak to audiences around the world and I, and I train speakers as well and I, I tell them that when you speak that there's, a, there's an objective that you want to achieve when you speak to an audience because how people live their lives is a result of the story they believe about themselves. So you as a speaker, when you speak in this program, when people see you, what you do is distract, dispute, and inspire. 
You distract people from their current story with your guests and the questions that you ask through the process of the ongoing questioning and the way in which they respond and the things they have learned. You dismantle their current belief system and inspire them to, to create a new chapter with their lives. And so, but that's an ongoing process of, of constantly interrupting that conversation, what psychologists call your self-explanatory style, because life is, is going to beat up on you in so many ways, and many things, they come back, you know, negative thoughts and, and how you feel about yourself, they don't die, they, they come back once you stop doing the maintenance work on your mind. We have to believe in ourselves, and that's an ongoing process, engaging in things that, that will help us to believe in ourselves because we, we are cultivated in a world where we're told more about our limitations rather than our potential. And so faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing. And so we have to constantly go to seminars, go to workshops, listen to audio programs, and, and read books that will help to expand our vision of ourselves of what's possible for us. In life, what we're doing right now, it is, to me, an experiment with life. That there's so much noise in this world. And most people never achieve their goals because of the noise because it is so distracting. Uh, one of my students, her name is uh, Stacy N. C. Grant, and she wrote a book called Action, Action, Despite the Distractions. And so what most people do, they stop and they look around. The reason that Lot was, you know, was saying, don't look back, is because you become paralyzed when you allow yourself to be distracted and seduced by the noise of life, that you have to discipline yourself. The road to life is straight and narrow, and few there be that find it, because few there be that are willing to focus their minds. Where focus goes, energy flows. Few mm -hmm. there be that are willing to discipline themselves. And, and as a result, most people allow the dreams, their potential, their goals to be derailed because they take their eyes off of what it is that they're at. Responsibility to me, is, it's about understanding and knowing that you have the power to control your destiny, that it's about living your life from a place of creation, that most people go through life doing what I call living their lives as volunteer victims. When you take responsibility for your life, it's about knowing that you have to develop yourself, that you don't get in life what you want, you get in life what you are. You have to develop your mind, you have to develop your skills, you have to have a talent, ability, that, that you are cultivating so that you can create value for the world with what it is you have, with your gift. Just think about if you were an immigrant and you're watching television and you see people who can come from white cultures with no problems whatsoever, like the president's in-laws, but brown people coming from other countries, they're separated from their children and, and put in cages, and there's a silence. There's not millions of people protesting and saying, this is not who we are as a country. Uh, this is inhumane. I believe that all of us have a responsibility that we want to live a life that will outlive us. The work that you're doing. There are people that you will never meet whose lives that you've transformed, that you, you are living a life that will outlive you. Just think about the fact that this program has given a lot of people hope, and there's hope in the future. It gives you power in the present. Every 40 seconds, someone commits suicide. But because of something you say or some guests that you've invited, and, and as they share their story, you interrupt that story of being hopeless and powerless and, and not wanting to be here anymore. And because they took the time to watch, you create an experience. Oliver Wendell Holmes said that once a man or woman's mind has been expanded with an idea, concept, or experience, it can never be satisfied to going back to where it was. And so at the end of the program, at the end of one of your presentations, there are people who, because of you, their lives will be transformed and they will become 
a, a pencil, as Mother Teresa would say, in the hand of God and start writing a new chapter with their lives. So I went to the next mode necessary to start talking to people and seeking and asking for what I wanted and leveraging relationships and trying to find out how do the people do it that went ahead of me? How do they do it? And then what is it I need to do? How is it I need to train myself to develop myself? What's the resources that will be required in order to make it happen? And as I start seeking out and asking questions, I started running into people saying, I know someone who can help you do that. And they helped me get connected with those people. Remember, we have so much energy that can take us so far. It's necessary that you hook up with some other energy that can take you to the next level. I hooked up with them, they said, let's, let's go. I said, away we go. <laughs> And guess what? Here we are. <laughs> I love it. You want your stuff? It's necessary you take responsibility for it. That you make it happen, that you don't give up, that you don't take any objection or disappointment or defeats personally, that you keep on keeping on, that you don't decide that I can't make it because you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel, that you realize that's a part of the program. And here's something you've got to resolve. Say this to yourself every day. See, as long as you're breathing, you got a shot at your dream. That's the way I resolve. Say this, please. It's not over until I win. You've got that right. It's not over till I win. Not over till I get through. It's not over till I get over. Not over till I get what I want. Door can't open today, look out. I'm gonna come back and take the hinges off. That's, that's how you gotta do that. You've got to have that kind of courage, that type of determination. If you wanna make it happen, it's you. That you've got to take personal responsibility to make it happen. I think that the people that are, on, that are discovering how to unleash their greatness are people who have the mental resiliency yeah. and the courage to face failure that you will fail your way to greatness. Mm. That most people allow their fear of failure, 80% allow their fear of failure to outweigh their desire to succeed. When you're willing to fail again and again and again, when you make up your mind to become unstoppable, when you make up your mind to become a no matter what person, then that will then give birth to a part of yourself that you don't know right now. And one of the things I emphasize that changing is not easy, that changing your life, changing habits, reinventing yourself, yeah. picking yourself up after life has knocked you flat on your back. I've got to say, when life knocked you down, try and land on your back because if you can look up, you could get up. Well, that sounds cute, but that's not easy. When yeah. I was diagnosed with prostate cancer 17 years ago, that first time that happened, I said, hey, I can handle this. Then when it came back a year later, I mean, last year, 17 years later, and this time, it metastasized to seven areas of my body and ate 40% of my T1 vertebrae. Now the stakes are higher. Is this life saying, okay, Mr. Motivator, you beat cancer the first time. What you gonna do now? <laughs> you know, I started laughing. When the doctor told me, he said, why are you laughing? Are you in denial? I says, no. I said, I feel like Mother Teresa. He said, what do you mean? She said, Lord, I know you know how much I can bear. I just wish you to have so much confidence in me. <laughs> Said, so I said, the stakes are higher. So I've got to dig in and got to fight more. Because at the end of the day, life is a fight for territory. And once you stop fighting for what you want, what you don't want will automatically take over. And so it's a fight. It's a challenge in life every day. And what we have to do is embrace it. What we have to do is see it as a project to be worked on. I read something once that I live by, said in life you will always be faced with a series of God-ordained opportunities, brilliantly disguised as problems and challenges. And so I see even cancer as a gift, as a God-ordained opportunity. 
the things that affect most people that they don't even realize. I did not know that my relationships affected me. My mother said, Leslie, if you run around with nine broke people, I guarantee you, you'll become number 10. <laughs> okay. So, well, come to find out, mama was right. She only had a third grade education. But the studies indicate, uh, MIT, that you earn within two to three thousand dollars of your closest friends. So, so poverty and, and living a mediocre life is communicated mind to mind. And so your relationships can hold you down or they can lift you up. So I teach people to practice the principle of OQP, only quality people. Dr. Dennis Kimbrough said, if you're the smartest one in your group, you need to get a new group. Mm. And so it's very important that people upgrade their relationship. When I speak, it's not about me. My prayer is more of V, less of me. I'm encouraging people who are serious about speaking. Don't just do it for the money. You can make a lot of money. I, I earn more in one hour than 90% of the American public earn working for five years. Mm -hmm. But when you find something that you love, you will study it. Something that you love, it becomes a difference between being in speaking and speaking being in you, that you will mm -hmm. become not just confident, but you will become competent on that. And what do you say uh, to someone who are saying, oh, nobody around me are believing in me? And that's okay. Um, if you have that, that's great. If you don't have it, yeah. it's okay. I, for years read books of people who I didn't know, but I considered them as my personal mentors. I, yeah. I studied Winston Churchill, who said, the truth is incontrovertible. Malice may attack it, ignorance may deride it, but at the end, there it is. I studied Earl Nightingale, who said, all of us get in life what we are, not mm -hmm. what we want. All of us are self-made, but only the successful will admit it. So yes. I studied these people and they mentored to me. I, I feel their spirits. I, I surrounded myself in my bed with their your, books in, and, in and their audio and my imagination and listening yes. to their audio programs. Yes. So how much does the library card cost? It's free in the United States. I don't know what in your country. So I suggest that you spend time working on yourself study the high achievers. Mm -hmm. I did that to find out how did they get there. I studied the life of Frederick Douglass who said, we won't get everything that we fight for, but everything we get, it will be a fight. And so as you study these people and imagine yourself in their position and in your mind's eye, say to yourself as mm -hmm. I did, if they can do it, I can do it. They put their pants on one leg at a time. They breathe there just as I do. And so I believe that what you, what you focus on the longest becomes the strongest. What we think about, we bring about. When you train your mind to serve you yes. by reading a minimum of 20 to 60 pages a day, listening to audio programs, writing goals down, reaching, reading them three times a day, you're literally creating a new mental blueprint and imagining and seeing yourself already living from the goal. You begin to do some things that what most people look at and, and see as magical. If you want another awesome video in our Black Excellence series, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll enjoy it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there.